Yes, welcome. I would like to invite everyone to come a little bit closer. Um, be comfortable, make yourself comfortable, and we're going to begin. We are Misha and me. My name is Rico. Uh, I founded the nonprofit Gesellschaftsspiele. Uh, we believe that football can be free of discrimination, and what we do exactly we'll elaborate later on. We have about 45 minutes, and these 45 minutes we want to give you a little mix of football and fusion, which uh, is a very <laughs> kind of battleground. Uh, we imagine that uh, we want to talk a little bit about the World Cup, about the World Cup in general, uh, about FIFA, and uh, our main focus point is going to be the German football scene and the German fans, and then we're going to talk a bit about our uh, non-profit and how it could be. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the people here that we can actually be here, and uh, it's a bit spectacular fusion in football. It's a thing that never really fit together quite well. A couple of years back, I remember we uh, suggested to do something football, and we got quite a rude email back, which said, oh, nobody's interested in football here. And we were like, all right, sure. And I know from my own experience, when there's World Cup and Euro Cup, uh, while fusion is going on, a lot of times that happened to be simultaneously. And there was always this kind of weird thing. Most people that are here are not really into Germany or football, or not into both, or into either one, which is fair, fair enough. You can you kind of feel the same. But the, it, there was a bit weird situations. There was a couple of people that would would secretly sneak away and hide away and hide out where they would watch football, turn down the volume. One of the most uh, weird scenarios that I experienced myself is I think Germany was in the semi-finals or something like that, and the voluntary fire brigade around here had public viewing, and they just kind of did that for their, uh, their, their, their members, and they were like kind of expecting 20 to 30 people, and then all of a sudden 200 people showed up that were kind of the <laughs> expelled from the fusion who in secret were watching and returned as if nothing had happened. A quite positive effect. Uh, I think there was two or three flags that then ended up uh, at the fusion, and there was free cocktails offered for in return for flags. And we knew football and fusion don't really work together in fusion in Germany also. And we are going to talk a little bit about... Um, we don't really want to do an extreme monologue. We kind of want to get into a dialogue with you guys. What do, what's your point of view? How do you see if your girlfriend or your boyfriend's suggesting to watch uh, Germany together, is that something that you can do without feeling weird and awkward about this? There's nothing that we have a clear-cut answer. We have different opinions in this matter, but we kind of want your uh, view on this and your perspective. So uh, to the audience, uh, please raise your hands or your beer if you are interested in football or uh, have a club that you follow. Okay, it's a few. Who is interested in the World Cup? For aesthetic reasons. <laughs> Great. Uh, so there's uh, a lot less. Who is excited that Germany got kicked out of the World Cup? Uh, that's, that's my fusion. All right. So World Cup, let's begin. Uh, just a few fun facts. Um, if it's too low level, we can make this a bit more specialized. Just a few things in general. The World Cup. We always say World Cup, but in concrete, it really means FIFA World Cup of men. It's the FIFA World Cup of men. It existed since 1930. Uh, Uruguay was the first ones to host. Uh, it's a good example that football is never non-political. Uh, there's a few people out there that have this mantra where football is football and politics will be politics. Um, it's it's a quite popular song by a Nazi combo, uh, which is complete bullshit. In 1930, when Uruguay hosted the first World Cup, they hosted it because they had the 100 years jubilee of their uh, founding of the state. And that's why it happened there in that particular time. The World Cup happens every four years, as you know. Uh, you have to qualify for it. There, it started with 13, 16, 24, now 48 countries. Next World Cup, there's going to be even more countries. Um, I believe there's about 200 member countries of FIFA that can 
um, enter to participate. And that's, uh, yeah, that's part of the problem, to be honest. The World Cup is quite Eurocentric. It's focused on Europe and South America, to be honest. Asia and Africa are kind of dropping off the radar. The FIFA is trying to do some nice gimmicks to make it a bit more exciting, to have it a bit more TV compatible so there's even more countries. I believe that there's going to be a, a cup where all countries of the world are part of it, like back in the days, uh, the one that would host the, the cup itself. Uh, was the first time when like South Korea and Japan were doing it together. Uh, it was like an appeasement kind of uh, thing where they would give it to Asia and then they gave it to two countries straight away. And now this time you maybe saw that this decision that 2026 is the first time where the World Cup is going to be hosted by three countries, US, uh, the US, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, what I'm going to go to criticism on FIFA next. I could probably talk on this about for a week. Uh, one of the major points of FIFA, or it can be criticized upon, maybe you heard about this, that Donald Trump said that he has very much, he understands very much uh, who votes against uh, Mexico, Canada, and the US. And I mean, that's as much as I can say about football is football and politics is politics. It's enough said, huh? Uh, I can see goals when I watch football, and like there's a lot of feel good images. Um, a lot of times um, there's this kind of mainstream audience, attractive women who hug each other. I rarely see women, if I see men being excited about something, they ha probably a lot of times have something e extravagant, like a big hat or something like that. FIFA wants to generate beautiful pictures. And um, yeah, that's they obviously managed to do that. The FIFA, that's their job to select these images. And they have all their the sole and only rights holder for the TV. And it's like miniatures. There's contracts that work out exactly what images are shown and what aren't shown. Like, for example, what's not shown is if there's like pyro, like uh, rockets and stuff like that that are being shot. Like, they, they wouldn't show that. There's no political signs. They wouldn't be shown if there's any sort of fights happening. Uh, FIFA wants to show that the beautiful Brazilian women uh, with the funny Mexican women kind of celebrate, and that's the kind of image they want to create, and that's what they want to trans tra transport. Uh, what else can you criticize uh, about FIFA? It's really hard for me to start. Like this, There's so much. It's almost like a mob kind of uh, clown. It's, you can, I mean, obviously you can kind of um, talk it down, uh, but at the same time, like all the attributes that's attributed to the mafia, it's fairly similar to the mob, uh, to the mafia. There's like the, the kind of, um, helping one another out and um, it's like the the with the way that people are related to one another like the nepotism that is clear within FIFA it's like this it's, it's, it's they're not even trying to hide that anymore at this stage uh, there's like um, you can look at it quite closely and then you understand exactly who is related to whom and who works with what like for example the head of the Brazilian uh, organization committee has um, has like the company for, and then his son ha like founded a company that would then um, submit for um, well, basically they were trying to build stuff, and then uh, the son got the uh, got the got the contract without any competition. And like all these sort of weird things that are going on with FIFA. The FIFA is gigantic, it's enormous, it's uh, beyond state level. It doesn't have the feeling that it should or need to abide by national laws. You can compare it to the UN with the difference that the FIFA has a lot more influence. If you want to um, compete or if you want to apply for hosting the World Cup, um, you have to follow a crazy amount of rules, and if you don't follow those, you can't even apply for hosting the World Cup. Like, uh, freedom of tax is one of those examples. Uh, in contract that all sponsors that are part of FIFA will have tax freedom after FIFA has given uh, the country the 
the hosting spot. Uh, you can kind of imagine in South Africa, for example, um, there was there were millions, millions of deficits that were run by by in South Africa. But for FIFA, it was an absolute win. It was a win-win scenario. They could show that they're they're not forgetting Africa. They're South Af but South Africa is the ones who are then all of a sudden um, have to deal with um, an em enormous amount of debt that was generated by this event. Like in, in most big events ha try to find a fair deal and like they have these taxes that are paid, but FIFA uh, FIFA basically makes sure that all their sponsors don't have to pay any taxes starting at the point where the application process begins. Um, I don't really even need to read up on this. I actually have it at the top of my head, what sucks about FIFA. FIFA is an old men's club. It's an old men's club. I'm, I'm not even, I didn't write any books on FIFA, but just look at the books. And, and if you see the executive committee, you can just see 70 to 80 women, uh, men, I'm sorry, and no woman at all. It's almost like a backlash to the 50s. And even back then, you'd have a few women amongst that group of men. The FIFA is unbelievable, intransparent. Uh, there's so much that is related to sponsoring and money that you will never find out, will never find out. The FIFA keeps that completely under wraps. Uh, they have certain rules on what information is allowed to be given out. And they have an absolute monopoly, monopoly on, they have no competition. Um, so there's, n there's nothing like a KIFA, and they do another World Cup with like cooler and more social uh, moves. But the FIFA is, is the sole and only organization, and that's it, and like they have a tax monopoly, and they obviously also try to uh, protect their sponsors. In there's uh, there's a there's a ban around the the places where the events of FIFA happen, and then only the ones that are part of sponsors are allowed to uh, to 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 advertise there. It's so called a neutral zone, except for the sponsors. So they're the only ones that can then advertise there. Um, there in the Ukraine. In the official fan festivals, there was only, depending on the beer sponsor, like for example, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was only the beer sponsors who were giving money to FIFA. And then under the table, there were local beers that were being sold. These kind of situations uh, is what FIFA generates by forbidding um, other local companies and entrepreneurs uh, to, to offer uh, their goods. Um, for the benefit of their sponsors. That's maybe one minor aspect, but FIFA dictates how much a ticket will cost. Uh, they dictate when a game starts on TV. So if the World Cup is in a country where they kind of just go to that, it actually can happen there, but the, the central audience is in Europe, so obviously in Japan, they start a game at 11 a.m. so that uh, Europeans which is their central audience can watch it in primetime television. So basically where most of their audience are so that it shows there at, at 8 p.m. So FIFA um, has so much power that they obviously can also, could use their power for good, but that's not what they do. They don't really uh, try to build up something to make it more sustainable. And um, there's about 30% of material that they use could be sustainable, and they could actually have and plead for fair uh, labor laws and uh, working conditions, but FIFA doesn't do any of this. FIFA is super intransparent. Nobody in the world understands why they give the World Cup to Qatar. Qatar does not have a fan base. They have nobody interested in football. There is crimes against human rights, and regardless, the World Cup goes there. And it's, you can't even, you, it's, it's not even a question of there's anything that's going wrong. It's like a horrible, horrible organization that is uh, disregarding any kind of horrible stuff that's going on. Um, I've also, I had to look into this a lot because I was looking for stuff that maybe is getting better. Okay, so they have an ethics commission, which means that they want to check or see how certain monetary flows are happening um, and that were maybe a bit questionable and how those can be explained. Well, nice, okay. That's a step in the right direction. 
But then at the same time, it's maybe not so nice if you consider that the guy who's in charge of this ethics commission is being paid by FIFA. So of course, he's not going to bite the hand that feeds him, right? Like, yeah. Um, enough about FIFA. I think if you want to look at things that are not so great, we don't have to go that far. We, we're going to talk about Germany now. For those who came here a bit later, um, for those who've been a fusion for a bit longer, Germany just lost um, and is uh, uh, out of the World Cup now. They're not participating any longer. That's uh, worth a round of applause. <laughs> it's a difficult topic. For me personally, it's not difficult. I know how I personally am positioned with regards to Germany um, and what my position is if Germany plays at a World Cup. But all of us who sit here, of course, have friends who are maybe more chill in square courts about that. Um, they have arguments like, oh, it's just football. Or why do you have to enter politics into everything? No, this, is, this isn't so serious. You don't have to be a convinced AFD person, like a far right party in Germany, um, to actually defend yourselves and say that you have a lot of fun. For example, if it's just people saying that they enjoy this feeling when they're doing a public viewing and this feeling of community that um, is created in those instances. Um, well, I can't find this piece of paper right now, but I can talk about it anyway. So we're not talking about people who have a problem with Germany. I think we all have the same opinion there. And we're not talking about people who are super amazed at, like, and love it if Germany gets further. Maybe there are some people here who see it that way, who say, well, I support the team. And this, the team has also become more diverse. Um, and some things have changed for the better. And um, I want to talk to these people. There are enough reasons to be happy about Germany not making it to knockout rounds. And if you don't find, if you can't find reasons for this within yourself, then I have a few reasons for you. For the context of, uh, with regards to the context of Germany, German like German fans. So I have a few mentions. So Argentina in 1950. Uh, 75. Um, this whole World Cup was a scandal in itself. It should never have gone there. Um, the country was being ruled by, by a military junta at the time. Thousands of people were killed at the time, and the actual scandal was that the World Cup was happening there in the first place. Um, Paul Breitner, who was a player for Bayern München, who was a lefty. Um, actually, there are um, fam famous photos of him under a Che Guevara poster. He said he wouldn't shake the hands of those generals when he was there. Um, surprise, surprise, he didn't get to go to the World Cup that year. Actually, so it shouldn't have been happening there in the first place. But so we're now looking at the DFB, the German F Football Association, and the DFB um, behave completely wrong on many different levels. One thing that happened, um, Betty Vogt, maybe some of you know him, he was um, coaching the German team later. Um, Betty Vogt at the time made like a qu classic quote, which I think said a lot about um, his state of mind because he said he didn't know why everyone was so upset because he didn't see anyone being tortured on the streets. Well, that says a lot about what he was thinking. At the same time, the DFB president of the time, Neuberger, um, did a reception for um, an, S, an S general um, called Rubel. As you may know, Argentina at the time was a popular location amongst Nazi, amongst Nazi pigs of like, Germany. Um, and so it was very clear before that Rudel, he'd announced himself, right? So there were would have been many opportunities to prevent him from kind of like coming to where the German team was in Argentina. So nobody did anything against that. He did, he visit, visited the camp. There are photos of him shaking people's hands um, and how he's talking to the German um, entourage. And so I think that in itself would be impossible today. Um, it happened at the time. What did the DFB say? So the, or the DFB president, he said, he can't understand this criticism coming from Germany at him. That would be totally, it was totally over exaggerated and it would be an ins insult of every, of all soldiers. Like he used those words, like really savor these words. We're not talking about a small soldier here, right? Even that would be inappropriate, but we're talking about someone who was a general um, under the Nazis who, uh, who welcomed the German team in Argentina in their training camp. So now I'm kind of like moving towards um, more recent times in the 90s, you could do an entire presentation on the World Cup 1990 when Germany won the World Cup, but many Eastern Germans used that 
first chance to travel, um, to travel to Italy with others, there were many really ugly pictures from the time, something that was never actually discussed broadly, right? Like all of that was completely lost um, in this like wild, um, in this wild enthusiasm. Um, so we talk about those grand photos. We talk about those, but we don't talk about the fact that this was the first opportunity for East German um, Nazis um, and hooligans um, to kind of like um, get in touch with their Western German friends, male friends, because um, it was mostly men. Something. So in 1996, um, there was um, a simple international match. It wasn't even part of the World Cup. Something that really caught me at the time um, in a negative way was a game in Poland. So it was clear before that hooligans and Nazis from um, Eastern Germany would be going there, um, particularly, yeah, so, so that they would all be participating. It was would be clear that there would be problems. But these riots obviously weren't unpolitical, but the thing that really remains in our minds is that um, after people were fighting um, uh, around the seats, then they unfurled a b banner that said we um, were greeting Schindler's Jews. I can't really say anything about that now, but like at the time, the way the way it affected me at the time, it was it really broke. Like it was like a taboo that was broken, and it was broken again. So someone who may study law, um, fun fact: there were different discussions how this could be treated legally in Germany because the like showing unconstitutional symbols, like this law of banning that, is only valid in Germany. But then two of these people, fans of a club called Union, were actually sued in court, um, which, which was um, an important case um, of, which was an important precedence, because they were actually showing this abroad outside of Germany. Um, and then there were discussions whether the TV stations that showed these pictures maybe were guilty as well. Um, then there was another case in 1998. Um, there's a guy called Martin Nivelle. He was a policeman. He was um, kicked to death. Or like, you don't have to love the police. That's not what this is about but it's about there's a terrible approach to everything, right? So this was Germany playing against Yugoslavia Lavia at the time. So there was tension in the air the entire day. There weren't enough tickets. It was really hot. Um, people got upset, but none of that is an explanation, right? So up, up to that point, that's kind of like normal for events of that size. But a lot of hooligans had announced that they would be coming and was very close to the southwestern Germany, so people were coming from Saarbrücken, from Kaiserslautern, from Karlsruhe. Um, and they actually had a meeting organized with people from Serbia, but the Serbian hooligans didn't actually get to enter the, the country, and like, people were like frustrated. Um, they couldn't get tickets, they couldn't enter the stadium, and then after the game, all of that exploded. So we're not talking about here about hooliganism or whether it's morally or ethically problematic, but I think what we're talking about is when people lose their humanity, and that's one of those stories where that happened. There was a group of maybe 40 hooligans from northern Germany, um, around Hanover and Lower Saxony, um, and some others from Braunschweig. So they grabbed three policemen on patrol. It wasn't even about, like, maybe you could, like, explain it rationally in some way if they wanted to, like, go into the stadium and get into the stadium. But this was after the game, right? There wasn't even, like, a reason. They just wanted some action. Um, so they saw these three guys, harmlo harmless, all th pretty old on patrol. Two of them got to run away. Martin Nivelle didn't manage to get away. Later, people talked about it wasn't, he, yeah, he was basically kicked to death, stomped to death. Um, it was a very short time frame, but yeah, Martin Nivelle fought for his life for two weeks, and now, oh, no, oh, now he's um, disabled. Oh yeah, before it wasn't clear whether he, when he was talking about this earlier, it wasn't clear whether he died, so he obviously didn't die, but he's severely disabled, is blind in one eye, and that's what German fans did, managed to do. So what about today? Today, the national team um, has gotten much less interesting. So, for example, like the B and C team and people who are mostly interested in action are feel or are annoyed by the commercialization of the national team. Um, and from what I hear, there's a lot of other people who also are annoyed by that. So there's like really stupid choreographies that are not invented by the fans themselves, but by the fan club of the national team, which is powered by Coca-Cola. Um, and so it's really this commercialization that it's like being exaggerated further and further. But 
on top of that, you also have like the Nazi football fan, but then you also kind of like lose interest because there are t too many people um, who are not classically white, right? So some people um, find it weird. I'm not sure whether they should like cheer when Gerhard Asamoah um, scores a goal because, well, great Germany, but like also he's black. So for some people, there's like a contradiction there. So um, with regards to international games, there's actually sinking viewer numbers. Actually, you think this is maybe a good uh, for me. This is a good trend, trend, and it's continuing. I think the only exception is when there are games in Eastern Europe, in Prague, in Warsaw, in Budapest. Um, then it's actually a much bigger happening, a much bigger event where hundreds of right wing hooligans are coming there from Dresden, Chemnitz, Zwickau, all cities in Eastern Germany. Um, then there's a lot of like animosities. They forget all the animosities between them between themselves, and then they all have like an event for themselves. But that's not even linked to the result of the game in an instance like that, or it's not linked to Germany itself. But it's more like a meeting of old friends and old pals. You may remember the pictures from Prague from not so long ago. There was an international game there, where after after the victor victory. Luckily, they, 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 they shout, like, Zeek, which is like, well, they don't turn into the full Nazi didn't sh turn into the full Nazi salutation, but there was, well, they pulled out all the old na Nazi shit, like, evergreens that people love to sing, um, we marched in again, hooray, hooray, the Germans are back, we came here to beat up the Jews, um, uh, Germany over everything. Um, the Mexico song by the uncles, that's really interesting. It's almost like a classic. If someone can explain to me why that's it's that way, I would love to understand that. The Mexico song by the uncles, uncles would was created um, for a World Cup in Mexico. It's basically extremely racist towards Mexicans, especially Mexican women. And it's compl so people love to sing it still without like that specific link to Mexico. Um, and personally, I wouldn't never go somewhere I w to, to see one of those games, but if I hear someone singing that, I know exactly who, who those people are, right? And um, another, uh, all of these things are really typical signs of like German hooligans. So that's the current state of the game. As far as I know, it's stayed quiet in Russia so far, not just with regards to the German fans, but also with regards to others. I think it's a topic in itself as well, which is probably also related to the fact that the Russian cops really clearly told their own Russian hooligans, keep, like, keep quiet, we leave you we leave you by yourselves usually, but if you touch any tourists, then you're really going to get into shit. Um, and I think that's also where the Russian side is kind of like keeping itself, st keeping keeping back. And so the people who usually are out for like aggression, which is usually like um, the, 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 the Brits or the, the English in particular, the Germans, um, sometimes the Dutch, like they're not that active, right? So I, th I guess like the distance is part of that as well, despite them being able to go there without a visa. Um, many are scared of the Russian cops. Nobody really wants to um, end up having to stay in a Russian prison just for like a small fight, in quote, quote unquote. Um, and I think that might also, and then another reason might be that generally the interest in Germany in the German team has is, has been uh, sinking. There's less and less interest. So that was a bit about the World Cup, but something about FIFA, something about Germany. We can talk about that more. Um, you can tell me what you're interested in. I um, also have questions for you. So for, again, about us, we're Gesellschaftsspiele. We have about 100 members. Most of us are generally interested in football, but not that's not necessarily necessary. But we're generally interested in a different kind of football. So we're not interested in homophobia. We don't want like terrible behavior on trains. And we're interested in many areas related to football and society. So our first event was um, about the role of um, uh, Turkish football fans in the Gizi protests, homophobia and Russian football, and we were talking about how we could do something in Northern Ireland and how that was related to religiousness. So there are so many topics that are extremely interested, interesting, and we wanted to have a structure where we can organize events like that ourselves. In, to in addition to that, we have a lot of events with um, refugees. Um, one project that we did was um, Big Fan, which was about um, Bundesliga, the German League, integration in society. So when this whole, well, 
when, when, when this whole migration movement was pretty strong, it was very popular to get people from um, refugee homes and like go see a football game with them and then like leave them there again. We thought, we didn't think that was enough. So someone who came from Afghanistan and from Syria to Germany, everything for them is new. Um, so what can we do um, to maybe communicate with them? How can we like communicate to them how not that life in Germany, quote unquote, is, but like how one part of life in Germany is. So we went to Hamburg. We didn't just do a tour around the stadium, but we also um, we also did a tour around the city. We sh we saw um, foot like blind football. Um, we talked to a refugee football team. Oh, we only have ten minutes left. Um, I'll be quick. So right now we're also organizing a culture program related to the World Cup. So we, most of us don't watch the World Cup because they're not interested in it and they're not interested in Germany in particular. But we were thinking that maybe others are doing that. Um, so maybe we can kind of like pick them up where they are right now. So public viewing is something that's later. And before of that, we're going to do an event on um, labor conditions in the football industry, uh, racism, um, about empowerment. Um, what, what about football fans against homophobia? So how can football really show its good side and its, po its positive side? We're going to have an event, and we did an event on corruption, but we also had um, a reading. Well, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff. That's the really nice thing. We, well, if you have a nonprofit, we're doing exactly the things we're interested in. Um, and so just briefly, we're going to show you some movies so you can have an idea of like what that looks like. Um, with, uh, with music, with music by someone who's playing at Fusion tomorrow, if you can recognize who they are, maybe. You're running after the trend. Um, I'm going to try my best here to translate. It's rapping. I'm distancing myself to, from distancing you idiots and riot kids. Um, from people who are marked by cops. So there's a rap song playing and it's difficult to it's difficult to translate because we don't have the lyrics. Everybody has their subject and this is mine. See how whack your subject is it compared to mine. The world is nice from these specific perspectives. Don't have a chat with the cops. Believe me when I tell you what I need, let people finish their sentence. And you're just as cool as the kids with an iPad. All right, that was our short clip uh, regarding the time that's running out. We're gonna finish this up, this monologue, and, and continue on with the dialogue. What are your thoughts? Can you, in a relaxed manner, kind of be for Germany, have a more relaxed relationship to football? We want to like to talk to you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I really want to also thank the lecture that was happening before. I was, it was, I was listening to it, and it was. And now we're talking about football bullshit, and that really matters. What they said before, like the lecture that was happening before. Um, okay, Rico, Micho, thank you so much. Um, I have a mic over here. If you have any questions, put, please put up your hands. I c I'll come over and you can ask them. Who has a question or comments? Ah, uh, well, in the front. Okay, great. Someone broke the ice. Hi. So in the very beginning, you were saying that FIFA um, really tries to suppress all kinds of like political images and really loves to show women they're really happy. I was watching a game, I think it was the first Iran game during the World Cup, and I had the impression that um, both when people were talking about it, reporting on it before, but also when with regards to the pictures that were being shown, um, the topic that's very present in Iran right now, which is women being allowed into stadiums, that 
I thought that was something that the FIFA really focused on with regards to like how those images were presented. Maybe you can kind of like talk about what you think that may have been. Yeah, great point that you're raising. Uh, the interest in FIFA was to show these images that would say uh, in Iran, uh, women are not forbidden to enter the stadium. It was like medieval times. Um, there's movements, there's actors, activists who fight against this, who obviously use the World Cup as a podium. And this obviously really deals into the hand that FIFA is dealing. So FIFA sucks, but they're not as medieval. And this is like an easy way for them where they can be full something. And those images and those those posters and banners, they will let allow. Uh, but something like where are the last bonuses from the FIFA executive committee, that is something that they obviously wouldn't show. Uh, and if, the, if you had a sign that said, what about uh, retirement funds in Russia? This is stuff that they don't like and where they can't get on board. Like, they will get on board with political science as long as they can be for it without hurting themselves. Uh, wait, wait, I'm just coming over t to you. Okay, so, I mean, these are like very banal, very simple reasons and it doesn't have anything to do with the US relations, maybe there's a different level there with regards to like foreign policy or different interests that might play into that. The personal opinion that I have, um, I don't know at the end, um, I think that FIFA, if they had some topics that are accepted by the public sphere, if there were three kids that had a sign we're against uh, hunting of whales, they would obviously also show that. Um, we have some more time, so if you dare, please put up your hands. Okay, so around the games, there's often a lot of like public reporting about the games, um, potentially of the countries where the games are happening and the cities where it's happening. And of course, there are lots of stereotypes that are being reproduced there, especially in Russia right now. So one thing that I'm remembering right now, um, I don't remember whether this was a German game happening. I think it was a game happening in a city and um, t this TV station was reporting about people working for the opposition and what they're doing there. So how, what's generally your opinion on that with regards to both public TV stations but also private papers? How, uh, they, how much, to what extent are they reflecting on this and too much are they critically interrogating FIFA and the political conditions? Um, and how do you think that has developed over the past years? Well, there's uh, quite a few questions in one. Um, I think we have to answer this on different levels as well. So in Germany, Especially, there was quite lots of lobbyism um, from uh, Reporters Without Frontiers. Uh, they were looking for the, they were looking into the German Football Association. Uh, I think 20 years ago, they probably wouldn't have done that. Uh, at least they they did get some input. But what really is sustainable from this, or if there's any actions taken, I don't think that's the case. That's a completely different question. Um, I I think, but it has been kind of that that question has been raised. Um, but starting the second that the World Cup began, nobody was interested in this any longer. And I think uh, the day before yesterday, there was a feature that I watched in the, on the public news. There was uh, just like a quick opinion piece on uh, Germany's out of the World Cup, so now we could look into the more social subjects surrounding the World Cup. But obviously, like only once uh, Germany is out of the race, kind of. So like. Isn't that shouldn't that be your your kind of uh, reporting duty the whole entire time, uh, regardless of whether Germany is part of the World Cup or not? Um, so, I mean, now obviously the crowds are out. Nobody is really interested anymore. People just want to. <coughs> people are just interested in having fun and partying and being entertained. And there's like it's so hard to to really place like subjects of societal interest and social consciousness and like these kind of questions you can only answer before and after the cup. Uh, thanks, yeah, I also just want to react to the, your question. Um, uh, this whole thing about the World Cup um, that we're talking about, we're kind of like going in the direction, how can we manage to have a proper critique of Russia but without doing exactly this whole Russia bashing, right? With the same train that is like being driven through every village right now because that didn't make a lot of sense with the World Cup, in our opinion. So we specifically wanted to talk about cliches about Russia, but also with structural critique. Um, we wanted to have representatives from Russia, 
themselves, but also representatives for Germany. Um, and we try to kind of like talk about this topic from different angles because all of us, we don't live in Russia, so it might be difficult for us um, to talk about this. I think it's a similar thing with regards to Iran. Um, we were um, talking to an NGO that originally um, there was a game between a, the Iranian women's team and a Berlin team, a Berliner club, um, and around this whole topic, um, around this whole team, they kind of like created a space where like female foot, football players could really meet each other, right? So they wanted to go beyond just like having an image and a nice report, but they were really trying to like go get to like an individual level. Um, so yeah, that was basically our own idea, which like we used to create the program. Any more questions? I don't see anything. Okay, so we'll stop here. Oh, someone's someone's shouting. Oh, over there. We'll have time for that. That that, that, that we must have enough time for that. Hi. First of all, thanks for the presentation. I'm interested in. So I might belong to one of the few who are actually for Germany and was for Germany during the tournament. Feel free to boo for that. As for myself, before the tournament, I told myself, well, we all agree that you can't separate politics and sports. But if I maybe watch this game, um, then I'm also interested in it for aesthetic reasons, right? Um, which team is playing better football? And we all know that a tournament like this is also, it's about separation and division, right? It's national nation states that are playing against each other but for example in the Bundesliga you have different clubs playing against each other so there's this constant division and this constant separating um, on a national on a global level um, and in the German league you have it on a regional level so I I just wanted to ask you how what's your what your position is on that because you can also just be interested in the football that a team plays and support the team because of that um, so be emotional about it, and I think like emotion and having a position on it is also belongs together, right? I don't want to get w watch a game where I'm not interested in who wins, right? I want to have a position on it. Okay, just really quickly and short, like thank you so much uh, for your question, and honestly, it's brave to like say something, and like honestly, I, I'm I'm drawing my hat. Um, I don't think we have to applaud, but um, <laughs> I accept your opinion absolutely. I, I I think I hear that a lot, to be honest. I personally find it really difficult to separate. I can't fundamentally uh, stop criticizing Germany and, 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 and the stuff, and then, oh, but they're playing so beautifully. Yeah, I mean, I, my perspective on this is like a, from, is like a fan of a Hansa Rostock, which has a, quite a big f Nazi fan base also, at least in the past years. Uh, I mean, a lot of times the games are really aesthetically pleasing, um, but there's, there's a lot of games that I'm super excited, especially the ones against Cottbos, where uh, you can like kind of get into it without really liking attractive soccer. Like I think this is a very emotional, personal decision. You don't really want to tell someone how to think, what to like, and this stuff. But just kind of open your thoughts to take something from this and think about this. Okay, so we are at 45 minutes now, and I have to end this game here. The game is over. Rika, Mich Rico, Micha, thank you so much. This is your round of applause.